Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure will resume its sitting. We'll commence business as soon as the doors are closed. Our next order of business is consideration of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2009, H.R. 915. I ask unanimous consent to discharge the Subcommittee on Aviation and call up the bill, H.R. 915, that the bill be considered as read and open to amendment at any point and without objection, so ordered. Now recognize <laughs> the Chair of the Subcommittee, Mr. Costello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. Uh, 915 is almost identical to H.R. 2881, legislation that was produced after many hearings, in-depth analysis, and a continued dialogue with the FAA, our colleagues, and stakeholders, and then approved and passed by this uh, full committee in the House in 2007. Unfortunately, the Senate failed to act on this legislation. Uh, we have made a few changes from H.R. 2881 uh, to this legislation before us today. Those changes include uh, deleting provisions in our original bill that were already enacted through legislative or the regulatory process. We included H.R. 5788, the hang-up legislation introduced by Mr. DeFazio to prohibit the use of cell phones on commercial flight. H.R. 5788 was reported favorably from this committee last September. We included the Aviation Safety Enhancement Act, which was passed by the House on July 22, 2008, but no further action was taken by the Senate. The Aviation Subcommittee held a hearing on February 11, 2009 to receive comments on this bill, and we have incorporated many of those suggestions into the manager's amendment, which we will consider very shortly. The FAA Reauthorization Act of 2009 provides historic funding levels over the next four years, including $16.2 billion for the Airport Improvement Program, nearly $13.4 billion for the FAA Facility and Equipment Account, $1.35 billion for research, engineering, and development, and $38.9 billion for the FAA operations. These funding levels will accelerate the implementation of NextGen, enable the FAA to replace and repair existing facilities and equipment, improve the airport development, provide for implementation of high-priority safety equipment, and deal with the expected 1 billion annual air passengers in the next 7 to 12 years. H.R. 915 changes the organizational structure of the FAA's Joint Planning and Development Office because of consistent concerns from both this committee and industry to transform the backbone of our aviation system. We elevate the director to, of the JPDO to the stature of an associate administrator for next gen within the FAA to be appointed by and reporting directly to the FAA administrator in order to increase its authority and visibility. To increase accountability and coordination of next-gen planning and implementation, H.R. 915 requires the JPDO to develop a work plan that details on a year-by-year -year basis specific next-gen related deliverables and milestones required by the FAA and its partner agencies. Like the 2007 bill, we increased the passenger facility cap from $4.50 to $7 to help airports that choose to participate in the PFC program meet their capital needs. According to the FAA, if every airport currently collecting a $4 or $4.50 PFC raised its PFC to $7, it would generate approximately $1.1 billion in additional revenue for airport development each year, which strengthens our economy and creates additional jobs at a time when they are both critically needed. In order to prevent what happened in 2007 to our aviation system, which highlighted a system fraught with congestion delays and poor customer service, this legislation mandates that air carriers and airports create emergency contingency plans that are approved and enforced by the Department of Transportation. This legislation also requires the DOT to publicize and maintain a hotline for consumer complaints, expand consumer complaints investigated, require air carriers to report diverted and canceled flight information monthly, and creates an advisory, an aviation consumer protection advisory committee. The legislation also requires DOT to conduct schedule reduction meetings if aircraft operations exceed hourly rates 
and are adversely affecting national or regional airspace. Finally, the provision also provides for civil penalties for any violations. Here at home and across the globe, more is being done to reduce energy consumption and emissions. The aviation community continues to be a leader in greening its operations. We further those efforts by establishing the Clean Engine and Airframe Technology Partnership and the Green Towers Program, which was modeled after what is currently being done at O'Hare International Airport. The United States has the safest transportation system in the world. However, we must not become complacent about our past success. To keep proper oversight on safety at FAA, this legislation directs the FAA to increase the number of aviation safety inspectors, initiate studies on fatigue, and requires the FAA to inspect Part 145 certified foreign repair stations at least twice a year. We also provide $46 million over four years for runway incursion reductions uh, in that program. We also uh, provide $325 million over four years for runway status lights and require the FAA to submit a strategic runway safety plan to Congress. Finally, there are two provisions in the bill that were in H.R. 2881 that I believe are necessary to improve morale at the FAA, providing for fair bargaining rights to employees of the FAA and at all express carriers and will help to maintain safety in our aviation system. The first provision requires that if the FAA and one of its bargaining units do not reach an agreement during contract negotiations, the federal mediation and conciliation services are used for or another agency agreed upon to uh, resolve uh, disputes in the uh, negotiation process. This process applies to the ongoing dispute between NATCA, the air traffic controllers, and uh, the FAA. This legislation sends the FAA and NATCA back to the bargaining table where the FAA declared an impasse. It calls for $20 million in back pay and calls for binding arbitration if the FAA and NATCA cannot reach an agreement. These are the same provisions that were in H.R. 2881 that passed this committee in the House. The second provision seeks to provide consistency throughout the express carrier industry. Workers who are directly involved with the aircraft operation portion of those companies, like pilots and mechanics, would continue to be under the jurisdiction of the Railway Labor Act, while the remaining workforce would be covered under the National Labor Relations Act. This is consistent with how UPS is structured today and is identical to the provisions in H.R. 2881. With that, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and all of the members of uh, both the subcommittee and the full committee uh, for working uh, to uh, bring this legislation to markup today, and I encourage uh, all of our colleagues to support this legislation. Well, I thank the chairman for that very thorough discussion of the highlights of this legislation, saving me a lengthy discussion of it as well. No need to duplicate the thorough presentation made by the gentleman. I want to thank him, thank Mr. Uh, uh, Petri uh, for their cooperative work and the committee staff in developing this, but also Mr. Micah, with whom we uh, worked very diligently all through uh, 2007 on this legislation, and uh, who's been a real partner in bringing it uh, forth, and, uh, and on the cooperation we've had from the beginning of the session to uh, narrow the uh, range of issues and, and uh, keep this bill to essentially what passed the committee in the House in 2007. Now, the Chair recognize the gentleman from Florida. Well, thank you. And I do want to, again, uh, express my appreciation for the cooperation in which we've approached uh, this reauthorization. Unfortunately, we're probably going to reach uh, the longest stage I can remember in not having a reauthorization, something the uh, chairman of the full committee and the subcommittee, Mr. Petri, and I have tried to avoid, um, and um, that's one reason why we agreed to move forward with this legislation. And we did agree to take uh, the bill that passed the House uh, uh, as the basis uh, starting point. I want to also thank uh, the Chairman uh, for accepting uh, several uh, Republican amendments and several uh, Democrat amendments to to uh, add uh, to the bill. Uh, we couldn't put everything in here, but we still do have opportunities, and I know there are some pending issues that we'll work uh, with you on. Um, we tried to improve what we had uh, there, and I want to, again, express my appreciation on the uh, insecticide notification provision, which uh, gave me some heartburn, that extra dose of pesticide uh, treatment. but. Um, 
uh, that is a much improved uh, provision and appreciate working with us. However, I want to say there are still some, although we've uh, dealt with that insecticide provision, there's still some major bugs in the, the bill. Um, one of those, um, um, there are again several old th items, and Mr. Petra and I raised these concerns, the foreign repair uh, station issue and its possible violation of international accords. Um, we have concerns about that. I think uh, we, we need to, uh, that's one that we probably need to look at and possibly have a he additional hearing and information input on and get it right in the final legislation. The FedEx provision, Mr. Cohen, from your side, uh, he, I know he has heartburn. Some folks from my side have heartburn. Uh, hearing or whatever it takes to resolve issues, try to get something that uh, can please both sides of the aisle. We have a few issues with the firefighters issue, and we do want to make certain that we do have the best uh, equipment and resources in place for that. Uh, OSHA still, we, we have a problem uh, with that, uh, some of those provisions. So we're willing to work with you, but we want to move this forward because the delay doesn't uh, benefit uh, anyone. Now, there is one uh, provision in here that's new. Uh, the chairman does have his prerogative. He consulted with me and did put in a, an antitrust uh, uh, provision. Uh, this antitrust provision uh, deals with uh, uh, approving some international uh, alliances uh, and uh, ex certain exemptions and antitrust provisions. Uh, I favored a study approach. The chairman, I believe, unfortunately, has gone a little bit f further um, than I would uh, have liked. And the provision isn't just a study. Uh, it, uh, it could, the way it's written, void any uh, antitrust immunity granted by DOT before the uh, date of enactment unless the, an exemption of antitrust laws is uh, renewed by the Department of Transportation. It fundamentally changes the way it's written, DOT's antitrust immunity and air carrier alliance review process and policy. So I have some questions. Uh, uh, we do need to move this forward. I'm hoping we can improve uh, that particular uh, provision. And uh, we'll work with uh, the other side of the aisle and the, the chairman, uh, hopefully, in not just addressing the antitrust, but a couple of the other measures. Let me say finally, too, I'm. Uh, I am, cons well, I, I strongly concur with the provisions we put in here, Mr. Costello outlined on no longer uh, having uh, contract disputes come to Congress, that we have a means of uh, uh, resolving contracts disputes, and we all agree on that. I'm saddened that we do not have an FAA administrator and I don't have the bill in place, and that we're now looking at that we were told maybe last night to six months additional extension on FAA reauthorization. That's what the Senate has told us they're looking at, which <laughs> appalls me. I think on the NATCA provision, it also leaves our air traffic controllers left in the lurch. They've been left in the lurch for the last two years. I did everything I did, could to bring the past administration to the table to resolve that, and we know that there are some, there is some unfairness uh, to our air traffic controllers that do a great job. So uh, this puts off that resolution even further and with an F, without an FAA administrator, which I know Mr. Oberstar has expressed concern to the new secretary. I have uh, to the uh, president and the new administration. We get that individual in place, get this issue resolved and behind us. Uh, but unfortunately, it looks like we're Punting, uh, and it may be to this fall, and I'm, uh, I, I'm disappointed in that. But we'll, again, we have got to get a bill. We've got to get an administrator. So, with that, uh, yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman for those uh, observations. Uh, don't worry about the heartburn. There's always my land time. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, we'll deal with those matters in in due course, and and uh, in the spirit of this committee, uh, the. Uh, uh, this, the disappointment that we both share about the uh, uh, lack of an FAA administrator, something I predicted in, dis in discussion with the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, Mr. Uh, Petri, and with uh, the Senate, who wanted last year, wanted us to do a, a one-year extension of uh, authority for FAA, and I, so that 
we'd give the new administration time to have a secretary and administrator in place at the time. This was September. I said, look, it'll be April before they have an FAA administrator. And we're almost there. And uh, uh, the, uh, I, I know this administration is being very meticulous, especially when they had a few missteps uh, about uh, appointments. But the process has, has become you know, each new administration comes in and they raise the bar for scrutiny of uh, policy and appointive positions. And uh, this administration raised the bar even higher and it's taking even longer and more pages of documentation and more accountants. It's good business for accountants and lawyers. They're vetting these guys and they're spending a lot of time and women uh, who are going into these positions. Well, it means that some of the uh, policy positions aren't being filled in timely fashion. And that's not good. Makes it more difficult for us to do our job. Uh, now, however, we do have a very competent and very capable and very diligent Secretary of Transportation. And Mr. Costello and I, and I know uh, Mr. Micah uh, as well, have talked with uh, Secretary LaHood and encouraged him to move quickly on the air traffic controller contract. Our provision in the last Congress and again in this Congress is very straightforward. You settle it. You negotiate. But if within 45 days you don't, 45 days of enactment, you don't settle it, then the binding arbitration goes into effect. So they have plenty of time, and I hope they don't have until the end of the fiscal year be before uh, settling this issue. Uh, but they have plenty of time uh, administratively to bring parties together, bring in the OMB, and, and uh, I will uh, uh, reaffirm once again my appreciation for and respect for Mr. Micah's uh, role last uh, Congress, uh, beginning in June of 07, uh, when we uh, brought the uh, Secretary of Transportation, the Administrator of FAA, uh, an OMB representative, a White House representative, Mr. Costello Chair, the, and Mr. P. Tri, the controllers were all gathered in one room. And we spent hours <laughs> from June, July, and August. Labor Day weekend. And Labor Day weekend. And then back in September. And there was just intransigence, mostly on the OMB side. I think if Mr. Sturgill, I honestly believe in my heart, if he had been given free reign, he would have found a way to resolve it. But the uh, fact is, it isn't resolved. And the uh, issue hangs over us, and we have to uh, press that issue forward. And while we may have to do a longer uh, term extension than I would have liked, I think we have to, to uh, extend authority. We'll do that in separate legislation. We have to work with the Ways and Means Committee on it. Uh, through this fiscal year in order to assure continuity of funding under the Airport Improvement Program. I don't want airports to have a stop-and-go uh, stop uh, uh, facing them on uncertainty of whether funding will be available. They get a contract underway and they may have to pull th that contract down because the authority runs out. That's not good public policy. And while uh, we, we have a very important, a much bigger bill than in the past, uh, we don't want to, uh, uh, to, to delay or, or uh, obstruct or cause uh, by uh, inactivity one or the other body obstruction to the, uh, to the flow of construction grant monies for airport projects that are urgently needed. <laughs> Now, later I will discuss my provision on the manager's amendment dealing with antitrust immunity. Suffice it to say at the moment that antitrust immunity is not a grant in perpetuity. It is subject in, in, uh, in most of its application by the Justice <laughs> Department to review. And my purpose in setting this uh, provision forward is to cause a uh, review of these international alliances that are growing in their scope, creating global mega carriers, alliances that have grown in, into, uh, in, into these uh, relationships that are now protected by anti 
trust authority that will be the first step toward foreign ownership of U.S. airlines. I'll hold, hold my comments uh, from there. Uh, uh, Mr. Petri. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As, as we all know, it's vital we authorize the uh, uh, bill before us, it's, and it's a bill that I want to support, and it's a bill I wish I could support. Unfortunately, it currently includes several provisions that I, I cannot support. The first of these provisions would change the labor laws that apply to express carriers. Congress recognizes that given the national scope of the transportation industry, labor disputes require special consideration. This is particularly true in light of the fact that with a national and now global aviation industry, a strike by a local unit within a national organization could have far-reaching, dis uh, disruptive, and detrimental impacts to the U.S. economy. This provision virtually eliminates Congress's balanced approach in labor uh, organization matters and seems to target one company. F FedEx Express is organized and always has been organized as an airline and express carrier. I remain strongly opposed to this section of the bill and urge my colleagues to, uh, at, at the appropriate point, consider its detrimental effects on the U.S. economy. Another uh, controversial provision voids the current imposed contract with the Nash, uh, National uh, Air Traffic uh, Controller Association and provides back pay. According to FAA estimates, this provision could cost taxpayers an astonishing $7.5 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, this dramatic cost increase would require cuts to other important FAA programs, including safety oversight and air traffic control modernization funding. Changes that have occurred since the provision was originally included in H.R. Uh, 2881 must also be considered. We now have a Democratic administration. If he so desires, our president could address the NATCA contract administratively, and I encourage the administration to find a fair resolution in a timely manner, as our chairman has indicated he would support as well. It's unnecessary for Congress to insert itself in this labor negotiation, and I do not support the provision in this bill. Another provision would require notification to passengers about the use of insecticides on planes within 60 days of a flight. Uh, obviously, given the complexities of airline fleet management, this would be a nearly impossible requirement to implement and enforce. And furthermore, there doesn't seem to be a great public outcry concerning the use of insecticides on planes. So I'm pleased that the manager's amendment will uh, address this at least in part. Finally, I have grave concerns about the foreign repair station provision that directs the FAA to conduct twice annual inspections even on repair stations located in countries with whom the United States has entered into a bilateral safety agreement. While I might support the sentiment behind this provision, it ignores our bilateral agreements and puts the U.S. at risk of retaliatory action by other countries. Retaliation threatens hundreds of thousands of U.S. jobs at a time when we can least afford it. Aviation industry is vital to the U.S. economy, contributing an estimated $1.2 trillion in economic activity annually, and it's responsible for supporting roughly 11 million American jobs. So at a time when the aviation industry is struggling to survive, why would we put in place requirements that are unworkable, expensive, and not widely called for by by the uh, traveling public. Now more than ever, as the nation endures the hardships of a recession, it's important that this committee consider the negative economic impacts of these provisions. The potential for job loss coupled with the increasing federal responsibility that's both unnecessary and costly are tr tr troublesome consequences of some of the mandates included in, in the bill before us. The bill was written in an era of, uh, over a year ago, of financial stability. September of 2007, stock market was approaching over 14,000 points, and unemployment was at 4.7 percent. Now, with the market below 7,000 and unemployment having climbed to nearly 8 percent, certain provisions included in the bill will only further risk a fragile industry when it can least afford it. 
There is much good in this bill, and I hope to be able to work through the problematic issues as we go to the floor and later to conference. It is in everyone's benefit to draft a bipartisan bill that we can all support. And I also think it is important that the new administration be given an opportunity to weigh in as we formulate aviation policy. I yield back the remaining five seconds of my time. <laughs> uh, Chair appreciates that five seconds. And thank the gentleman for his thoughtful statement. Uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Larson. Just as we're moving forward uh, on this uh, bill, um, Mr. Chairman, I want to bring your attention to the concern I have with Section uh, 303, which does require the uh, annual inspections of FAA foreign repair stations. While well, I agree that we need to do everything we can to ensure the safety of these facilities, I'm concerned by the possible threat of retaliation by the EU. <laughs> It could mean that U.S. repair stations that do work on European aircraft may see their EASA certification fees increase or even lose that certificate. This could impact my constituents. I have six EASA certified repair stations in my district that could lose their maintenance certificate if the EU retaliates. These six repair stations collectively employ only 139 of my constituents, but 139 people employed these days is uh, quite a lot. As Greg Harwood, the president of Sound Air Repair Group, wrote to me last week, as an executive of a business located in the 2nd District of Washington State, I can attest that the economic health of my company, Sound Air Repair Group, will be negatively impacted if this legislation becomes law. But I, I do want to say, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate, appreciate your leadership on this issue and hope that as we move forward on this legislation, you will be open to finding ways to allay the concerns expressed by my constituents and ensure the, the ability of U.S. repair station operators to work on European aircraft. I'd also like to submit this uh, statement for the record on this issue. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for that uh, concern, which is expressed by Mr. Micah and Mr. Petri. It's speculative. The concern has been drummed up by members of the European Parliament who uh, have suddenly uh, come to life uh, on safety. And uh, I can say that when uh, I chaired the Aviation Subcommittee, uh, back in uh, 1989 and 90, uh, uh, through the 90s, uh, the, uh, to, through to the mid-90s, uh, we had uh, H.R. 145, the bill dealing with foreign repair stations, H.R. Uh, 145 for Part 145 of the Federal Air Regulations that deal with foreign repair stations. And, uh, and uh, we, were, we were prepared to um, to move vigorously on enforcement of hands-on inspection by U.S. FAA inspectors of repair stations in other countries, the Euro European Community said, "Oh, we're not up to we're not up to the standards of the United States yet. We don't have a Europe-wide safety standard. We have individual country regulations. Give us time. Let let Europe." set a single standard. Meanwhile, there are a lot of uh, repair stations uh, in, in third world countries uh, in the Pacific Rim that uh, were raising concerns. And uh, we uh, pressed the FAA to, uh, withheld on the bill, pressed the FAA to increase their inspection, their in the number of inspectors to go out and do this hands-on review of facilities and of personnel conducting maintenance on U.S. aircraft and engines overseas. And, one of, and then after September 11, we raised the issue uh, in, in greater depth, although we had earlier, on security. We want security background checks on foreign r repair personnel as we do on U.S. personnel. We want drug and alcohol testing on foreign aircraft maintenance personnel as we do on U.S. personnel. We want the site certificated as we do in the United States. We want the personnel to meet U.S. A&P standards, uh, airframe and power plant standards that uh, are uh, required for mechanics who do work on maintenance of aircraft. And the European community wasn't up to doing that. And uh, finally, they have developed this organization, EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency, 
which they're attempting to model after us, but they don't have the number of inspectors. They aren't doing the on-site work. They are uh, in the same place that the FAA was in the mid-1980s, reviewing paperwork, not engine work. They don't have people on, on maintenance floors. They're not uh, doing the same kind of work in the same caliber that we are in the United States. And I told that to a European parliamentary uh, delegation from the, uh, from the European, uh, uh, transport, European Parliament Transport Committee. And I said, just stop blowing smoke on this thing. Et je l'ai dit en français aussi. And I said it in French as well. So they couldn't mistake what I was saying. Uh, so this is just a lot of hoopla. Uh, Mr. Chair. I was a little surprised by uh, the, the number uh, cited by the gentleman from, from Wisconsin. Uh, and I don't want to prolong this uh, uh, debate on, on the bill because we have to move to the manager's amendment. But the gentleman cited seven and a half billion dollar figure. Uh, was that from OMB? Uh, Mr. Petri? We think it was from IATA. From? IATA? Oh, from IATA. Seven and a half billion dollars on the, uh, on the uh, controller contract? Oh, the controller contract is FAA. FAA. Yeah, well, they're wrong. Mr. Chair. Well, they're just dead wrong. The, uh, the Congressional Budget Office gave us a number of $340 million over 10 years uh, on their speculation of what a settlement might be. No one knows what that number will be. Well, FAA is just wrong, giving you the wrong. Same old gang from the last Congress. They haven't got their facts right, and they don't want this thing to happen anyway. Mr. So, Chairman. Uh, I urge. I urge uh, Secretary LaHood, as I did yesterday uh, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, to move ahead, get this thing settled. Uh, do others wish to be recognized? Uh, the gentlewoman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In lieu of an opening statement on this bill, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit a letter from Mr. Mark Carls, the general manager of Bombardier's service facility in my district, regarding Section 303 of the bill. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Are you Mr. Back? Chairman. Uh, Chair of the subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, just a, a few comments. One, um, I believe that I have uh, more employees working at uh, facilities in my district or uh, neighboring my district than any, um, anyone on this committee. If uh, uh, I thought that we were going to eliminate their jobs, then uh, I certainly would rethink this issue. Uh, there is no question in my mind that this is the right thing to do. Uh, we are dealing with safety here. We are only requiring the FAA to go in and conduct two on-site inspections at these foreign repair stations. I think it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, if the Europeans want to send their inspectors in the facilities in my district twice a year or twice a week, that's fine with me. I don't have a problem with that. And they shouldn't have a problem with us going into um, uh, facilities uh, in Europe or any other part of the world. The next uh, point that I'd like to make is that, uh, you know, this language was contained in our bill in 2881 when it passed this committee in the House uh, in 2007. Uh, it was the European bilateral that was signed last year in 2008 after this committee in the House spoke on this subject, and it didn't seem to bother the Europeans at the time when they entered into the bilateral. The, the last comment that I would make uh, concerning the, uh, the controllers, um, uh, this legislation, uh, my friend Mr. Petri, the ranking member, uh, uh, I want to make clear that we are not attempting to put Congress in the middle of negotiating a contract. What we merely are doing is changing the process so that one side, the, the process is not rigged for one side, which is what occurs right now. The current law says that if there is an impasse and one party walks away from the table, which the FAA did, then if the Congress does not get involved in 60 days, then the FAA or the side that declared the impasse gets to implement whatever they wanted. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, as far as uh, we're not negotiating wages, working conditions, we're changing the process to say that if there is an impasse, if they don't reach an agreement in 45 days, then it goes to binding arbitration. Regarding the $20 million in back pay, 
Uh, if you go back from the time that the uh, FAA imposed the work rules and reduced the salaries uh, uh, of the controllers, you will find that uh, the FAA has saved because of uh, reducing the salaries uh, by 30 percent on about 95 percent of the workers, you will find that they have saved um, uh, 50 million dollars. So to take part of their savings and to give it as back pay with a cap subject to appropriation I think is, uh, is reasonable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for that clarification. Do Members on the other side wish to be heard. Then Mr. Uh, Lipinski is next, and Mr. Cohen after him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> uh, Chairman Overstar, Chairman Costello, I commend you for your, your hard work in making this not only a great policy vision for the future of American aviation, but also a very pro-environment, pro-consumer bill. I want to thank you for working with me to include specific <coughs> language that will enhance R&D for <coughs> avgas alternatives, establish a center for alternative jet fuel research, require airports to consider recycling programs, implement QBS on projects funded by the PFC, and require a GAO study on compensating passengers for delayed baggage. All very good pro-environment, pro-consumer provisions. In addition, I'd like to commend Chairman Oberstar for including the provision that will help examine the impact of airline antitrust immunity on competition and require DOT to adjust its existing policies accordingly, which I think uh, is something that's very much needed right now. Now, very briefly on the issue of delayed baggage, since passengers now usually pay to check bags, they rightfully should expect increased performance, but I'm not convinced that the performance is any better. That's why I work to include language directing the GAO to look into this matter. Now, I would have much preferred to take the approach of a former distinguished member of this committee, uh, Bud Schuster, who pushed to compensate passengers with free tickets if they experience delayed baggage. <laughs> so this may only be the start on this issue. Again, I thank Chairman Oberstar and Chairman Costello for the great work on this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for his comments. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for your work on this bill and your commitment to the uh, aviation industry. Nobody in this Congress has a knowledge and commitment to seeing that we go forward a as you do. And I want to thank you for uh, your friendship and your support over the years that I've been in Congress. Uh, as you may recall, uh, you said last year you had a long memory, and I know that you do because you remember everything that's ever happened since Orville Wright went to North Carolina. And, and know all about aviation, and, and uh, nobody has a better knowledge of that subject than you. But you have been indeed friendly, and I know that uh, the number one industry in my town, uh, Federal Express, has problems with this bill, as I do. I expressed those last year, and, and yet, the, though I did, uh, you have remained my friend and my supporter and treated me with fairness, and I appreciate that greatly. You did not send any brown shirts after me, which I appreciate, too. Uh, that, was, that was appreciated. Nevertheless, I still feel that this is not a good provision to be put in this bill, not only because I believe that the law is clear and has been enunciated by courts throughout this land, including the more liberal Ninth Circuit in California that Federal Express belongs under the Railway Labor Act, but also because of the fact that uh, this economy is suffering in a way that we've not known before. And to subject the number one commercial carrier in this country to a strike which the Railway Labor Act is designed to protect our country against by seeing to it that there's only one union and not many unions that could in some small area take the railway express business and grind it to a halt. At this time in our economy, it is indeed a mistake, I believe, to inject this issue into our economic recovery and to potentially je jeopardize this bill. We know this will be the main point of contention in the Senate, and if we get to conference, it's going to be the main point of contention once again. It is so incumbent important for the stimulative effects and the reinvestment effects of this bill that it go forward. Uh, that I, I just wished we didn't have this provision in it. Uh, I appreciate your work and the work of the, the members of this committee. Uh, I did notice that there was a, 
there's another way to deal with this issue, and, and that would be the way that Gina Elrich of UPS said in 1993. And I quote the UPS spokeswoman, we believe that all UPS operations, including ground operations, are now probably subject to the Railway Labor Act because the ground operations are a part of the air service. That's what the Ninth District in California said about FedEx, that the ground service are an essential part of the air service and they are one and parcel in the same. There should be under Railway Labor Act provisions as Railway Express was. Federal Express is, is the Railway Express of the 21st century. And I believe it's a, a mistake. The better way to deal with this is to insulate our, our commercial activities in our nation from a strike from one particular area, small area, uh, and put UPS under the same provisions as Federal Express, which in 1993 they thought was the right thing to do. With that, and understanding in the same spirit as Federal Express that they promised delivery the next day, uh, each day, I will not offer an amendment to delay this bill and let this bill go forward posit absolutely positively in the Federal Express manner of guaranteed delivery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank the gentleman for those comments. Uh, it's very gracious, very thoughtful. Uh, you have a constituency to represent. You've represented that constituency very ably and uh, very uh, with great consideration. I, I will say very simply, Federal Express, by act of Congress, was granted a unique position. It was in 1996 in the House Senate Conference on the Aviation Reauthorization Bill. This amendment came, just parachuted out of nowhere into the conference. And Chairman Schuster, in words that I will always remember, said, I've been instructed by my leadership to accept this amendment. I never knew whether he was for it or against it. I think it is hard. He didn't like the idea, but there it was. It was on the table. He was directed to accept special language providing special status for Federal Express. I simply want to restore the balance. That uh, employees of a, quote, express carrier should be covered by the Railway Labor Act only if they are employed in a position eligible for certification under FAA rules, mechanics, pilots and they're actually performing the type of work for the express carrier. That's simply what we're doing, restoring that balance. Do others wish to be recognized? Uh, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, briefly to three issues that have been raised. Uh, the controller's contract, you know, we're losing our best talent, and we have a lot of people who are eligible to retire today uh, and who, because of the abusive workplace conditions that were uh, imposed by the last administration in their unilateral implementation and uh, changes to, to the salary structure, uh, you know, are, are just hanging on in the hope that uh, we'll make things right and deal with them honestly and fairly, and, and this bill uh, would put that process in place. And further, I understand we're, again, because of changes in the pay scale, uh, we're losing a lot of our trainees. Uh, maybe the economy's gotten so bad now they'll hang on in, in higher numbers, but we have been losing a lot, uh, again, because of the uh, problems with the pay scale and, and uh, the uh, lack of reimbursement during uh, their educational process. Uh, secondly, on foreign repair stations, uh, you know, there's, there's no issue here. We want to have the safest aviation system we can in the United States of America. We want it to be safer around the world. And all we want to know is that the people who are doing the work, of, uh, you know, overseas, where more than half of our heavy repair is done now overseas, which uh, is a loss of both jobs and certainly control and oversight, we want to know that those who have captured that work at lower prices than is charged in the United States of America are not using substandard labor, substandard parts, uh, or creating any other problems that could be catastrophic. Uh, it's not too much to ask that there would be two visits a year from an FAA administrator, I mean, an inspector. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if the EU or anybody else has problems with that, uh, we'll give them full reciprocity. They're, we're welcome to send their inspectors here and check out our system uh, anytime they want. So that, that, that would be how that would be resolved. And anybody who's saying, gee, this is somehow going to chase more business offshore. No, it might bring business back onshore when we find out that perhaps some of this work being done overseas is not up to the quality that's required of our uh, airlines and our shops here in the United States of America. So I, I would counter that argument with there's more potential we'll pick up work than we'll lose work under this provision. And then finally, I understand that uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Petri, Mr. Both, Mr. Micah told me he uh, had con 
uh, spoken to the disinsection uh, language uh, in a way that he felt that it was much improved, which I believe it is. Uh, but someone else raised the question, there weren't a lot of complaints. Well, there aren't complaints because people don't know. Uh, we ended the primitive practice during the Clinton era of having people walk on the plane and spray it on you while you're sitting there and have you inhale it to maybe get at the bugs in your lungs. I don't know what the idea of that was. Uh, because we found that it was, had absolutely no impact on the spread of disease-bearing insects or insects that cause harm to agricultural products. The United States of America studied it. We used to do it. We discarded it. We negotiated with, uh, through ICAO with most other nations, and most nations uh, on Earth uh, admitted that there was no efficacy except in very odd circumstances uh, of doing this on a regular basis and it was done away with. There have been proven health impacts. I've met with flight attendants. We held a hearing on this. Uh, people who were advocating that it should continue back when we held the hearing, I offered to spray them as they sat right there at the witness table and they demurred. Uh, but it was okay that we did it to passengers and flight attendants. So uh, it, it is a primitive, stupid practice still being carried out by some countries and it's being done in a way that's not so obvious. Some of them use permanent <laughs> insecticides, so if you're sleeping on the seed or whatever on a long flight overseas, you may well be, you know, uh, getting a nice little dose of insecticide. You don't know about it. Uh, so I just want people to know, and I believe when consumers know, uh, they'll demand changes in these countries that are doing it just because of pressure from agricultural lobbies for non-existent threats that aren't being taken care of by this problem will drop it. Uh, so that's why it's in the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It is indeed. Uh, the uh, uh, bill is now open uh, for amendment. I have a manager's amendment at the desk and ask unanimous consent the amendment be considered as read. A copy of the amendment is available at each member's uh, place. Uh, the uh, amendment includes uh, provisions on a number of uh, issues, safety, airline competition, airport programs, passenger rights, uh, including a fund, a funding for hiring of some 1,500 more safety personnel at FAA uh, over the uh, life of the uh, legislation, 2010 through 2012, for safety inspectors, technical specialists, operation support positions, and uh, improved safety for medical helicopters by reauthorizing funding for development and maintenance of approach procedures for helicopters ports that support all weather procedures. We have uh, uh, oversight uh, uh, of uh, uh, the voluntary disclosure program requiring the FAA to modify voluntary disclosure to ensure that inspectors verify that, have, that, ins that airlines have corrected the underlying causes as we uncovered in our very extensive hearing on Southwest and, and other uh, carriers. Uh, we also uh, provide in this amendment for a, a GAO study of the voluntary disclosure program. Uh, we uh, also include uh, the provision I uh, discussed at the at hearing and, and, uh, uh, and introduced a, a bill to deal with the decline of competition in international markets. Uh, purpose of deregulation was to increase, not to reduce competition. In the first five years after deregulation, we had 22 new entrants into airline competition. But eight years later, we had only five of those new entrants left. By 1990, there was only one left. And that one now has been swallowed up. That was America West. They've been swallowed up by U.S. Airways. And now the, the incumbent majors are, are being reduced as Delta acquired Northwest. Now, these carriers have alliances with international, with carriers overseas, principally European carriers, and some with the Chinese, a few with, the, with ANA and JAL in Japan. And then there came a point when Northwest sought antitrust immunity for its relationship with KLM. That is, exemption from the laws of competition, to combine and collude together to restrict competition, to restrict uh, pricing uh, width and, and, and variability. 
Uh, for a time, uh, actually, KLM and Northwest sold tickets independently on each other's aircraft at competitive prices, but with antitrust immunity, that disappeared. From uh, six competitors at New York, uh, J at New York's JFK, we're down to two. Uh, we'll see further restrictions if these uh, immunized international alliances are allowed to continue. I think antitrust immunity is, uh, is something given for a period of time and then subject to review. It's done in uh, motor carrier antitrust, uh, motor carrier association uh, <coughs> antitrust immunities. It's a practice that went back to the Civil Aeronautics Board uh, and, and then stopped and reviewed. And I think that that's appropriate. This legislation allows any, uh, or does not affect any currently proposed or yet unproposed alliance request for antitrust immunity does not prevent that from going forward. It just says that once given, after three years, there will be a stop. The uh, Department of Transportation is required in advance of that three-year end date to evaluate the value of, of that antitrust provision that exemption, that immunization of these uh, carriers, and see whether there is a benefit to the traveling public or whether there are negatives, and report back to uh, the Congress before that, uh, that antitrust immunity can be reinstated. Uh, That's all it does. But it's, I think it's a very important matter for us to, to, to determine whether we're slipping further into foreign ownership of U.S. airlines under the guise of antitrust immunity. Uh, there are other provisions uh, on, on the manager's amendment that uh, will uh, we'll deal with uh, uh, those who, uh, uh, excuse me, it's darn cold of mine. Uh, for those who uh, are uh, uh, operating as disadvantaged business enterprises and the airport concessions disadvantaged business enterprise program, we dealt with this many, many years ago uh, in the early uh, 90s on, on air, uh, airport rentals where black enterprises were being systematically excluded from contracts or from competing on airport uh, facilities. Uh, we dealt with that issue. We're uh, uh, providing some additional uh, uh, language uh, on consideration of economically disadvantaged. A business owner must have a personal net worth not exceeding 750000 et cetera, and other provisions. Don't need to go into all of those. Uh, Chair recognizes Chairman Costello for any comments he may have on the manager's amendment. Chairman, uh, thank you. I, uh, I think you've described uh, the manager's amendment uh, very well. Uh, I believe the uh, provisions uh, in the manager's amendment uh, reflect the ideas, comments, and concerns uh, that were raised during our subcommittee hearing on February the 11th. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, these provisions are important and uh, provide uh, uh, to uh, strengthen the bill. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would urge uh, members to support the uh, uh, manager's amendment. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Florida, distinguished ranking member. Well, uh, again, I won't uh, take time uh, or belabor the points that I made previously. I do have some concerns about the antitrust provision, several other measures, but we'll work uh, with the chair on the other side of the aisle. Hopefully, we can uh, uh, we can perfect uh, better perfect uh, some of these provisions. And if I may, uh, yield to Mr. Petra, our ranking member. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, the manager's amendment does contain some Im improvements, such as improvements to the in insecticide notification requirements. It unfortunately leaves many issues with the underlying bill unaddressed and contains new provisions that have not been fully vetted by the committee. Uh, one which we've previously discussed at some length is the foreign repair station uh, issue. 
uh, and uh, also included in the manager's amendment is a provision that seeks to terminate existing grant of antitrust immunity one after scrutinized review by both Department of Transportation and the Department of Justice. This immunity uh, has enabled U.S. carriers to compete in the most profitable world markets, promoting job growth and enabling airlines to better serve uh, 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 travelers. And at a time when the airline industry is under duress and job losses within the industry have reached alarming levels, airline industry and Bureau of Transportation statistics say that this provision could cost the industry another 15,000 full-time jobs. Given that Congress has just spent almost $800 billion to create jobs for Americans, I don't see why just two weeks later it makes any sense to put the competitiveness of U.S. carriers and of so many American jobs involved with those carriers at risk with this provision, especially without hearing and, and careful uh, consideration of the implications of it. Finally, the manager's amendment also contains numerous other changes, including provisions that have not been subject to scrutiny or discussion in the subcommittee, and uh, uh, they raise uh, concerns about potential consequences. And with that, I, I yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I've given this issue careful consideration for 22 years. I think it's time to move ahead with it. If the carriers can demonstrate that there are net benefits to the public from the government giving them protection from the antitrust laws, that their uh, service results in net benefits to the traveling public, their, uh, that authority will be renewed. They have nothing to fear, but they ought at least to be able to be required to demonstrate that there is a net benefit to the public. Are there others who wish to be recognized on the manager's amendment? Are there amendments to the amendment? Mr. Capuano? Mr. Chairman, I believe there's an amendment at the desk. And I'd ask that the amendment be considered read. Oh, okay. sorry, I, I, I misspoke. The gentleman's amendment is not to the manager's amendment. It's, it's to, the, to the underlying bill. So, question, if there are no further comments on the manager's amendment, then the questions on the amendment, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there amendments to the bill? Now the gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk, and I'd ask that uh, unanimous consent to be considered read. Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman is recognized in support of his amendment. Mr. Chairman, uh, this amendment quite simply tries to get all of the noise complaints in this country that might be going to various airports, trying to get them centralized. Uh, I have an airport in my district, and for years now I've been hearing complaints from my constituents that they can't get one central place, that everybody always points the finger that somebody else is responsible for taking the calls. Uh, you call the FAA, and they tell you that they don't... That they don't uh, put the calls together so there's no record, or there might be a record of three calls when I know for a fact I've gotten hundreds of calls from constituents who just gave up trying to get through. Uh, this amendment is simply an attempt to uh, get some sort of uniform uh, system together and then have a consolidation of those records across the country so we can get an idea of which airports might be addressing the issue, whether the, whether the issues are, are serious or whether they're just um, occasional fly-by-night uh, concerns of individuals. I know in my, in my case, in my hometown, uh, there have been some serious changes uh, of the flight paths, and for at least a year or two, there were lots of calls. Many of them just didn't get recorded because people gave up trying to get to the right person. There was no place to call. There was no, when they finally got a number, people told them, well, that's not the right number. You've got to call someplace else. All this does is it, it tries not to put too much on the FAA. Uh, it, says to, it says to the individual airports that they have to have a central number, the number has to be posted on the website, and then ask the FAA to each year just consolidate all those calls across the country and put a report together so that Congress will have some idea what's going on. Um, and, I, I, and I apologize, this particular amendment is a little late in coming. It was an issue that, honestly, I just forgot to throw in earlier. Uh, at the same time, I also know that we have a new administration uh, that I am happy to work with. I've had discussions uh, with your office, and there seems to be no complaint to the concept of the issue or the concern. And so therefore, Mr. Chairman, I intend to withdraw this amendment. I just wanted to put it out there and to let 
whoever's going to be in the FAA know that uh, we'll be calling him on this issue. Again, not trying to, to solve a problem, simply trying to find out whether there is a coordinated problem and to ask people to simply put it together in a thoughtful manner. I thank the gentleman uh, for his comments. The uh, chair of the subcommittee, Mr. Costello, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Capuano and I have uh, discussed this issue, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, an important issue that uh, complaints on noise uh, um, that uh, uh, should be addressed, and, and that it's important that we take a look at the policy here. And, and uh, I am committed to working with Mr. Capuano between now and the time we go to the floor on this issue. Would the gentleman yield? And I, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from. from Say we we are also interested in working with uh, Mr. Capuano on this. Uh, the noise issue is uh, an important one. Progress has been made. Uh, air, new airlines are uh, 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 additions to the fleet are coming at, uh, at improved levels. How this issue is handled is important because it could delay needed airport expansion in parts of the country if it's if it's not handled correctly. And so we're eager to address the concern, but to do it in a way that will enable the industry to move forward. I thank the gentleman for his comments, and uh, do want to point out that the bill contains a number of uh, provisions uh, to mitigate noise, encouraging the uh, implementation of flight procedures uh, with AIP help. Uh, requiring air environmental review of airport uh, procedures different from those currently in place. And we also increase uh, AIP funding for noise compatibility planning and noise mitigation efforts. There are a number of initiatives, but the gentleman offers a, 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 a different approach and a and distinctive uh, approach, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll review this further as we move the bill to the floor. Uh, the uh, gentlewoman from the District of Columbia. Well, I want to thank Mr. Capiano for bringing this matter forward. Uh, and I hope that I understand his withdrawal. He said the amendment was somewhat tardy. It's certainly not being withdrawn because uh, it's a, a cost uh, matter. The cost is really to the airports. Uh, I ask members if you have a noise issue uh, over your district, do you know who to call? Do you call? Uh, the airport, do you know which airline <laughs> flies, which planes? Uh, do you know which direction we're, you're talking about? I just think that is a, that is a classic uh, consumer issue that needs addressing. And a, the only uh, body that I can think of uh, in a position to at least get information and transparency uh, to the public is, of course, the FAA or a similar organization. At the same time, I want to note as uh, a area, much like Mr. Copiano, uh, that uh, this is one area in which the marketplace uh, and technology and the airlines themselves have seemed to come together uh, over the years. One wishes one could have more like that. Uh, that increasingly, for example, in my own district and in the district of my regional colleagues, we hear less and less complaints about noise. They were constant, certainly when I first came to Congress over Northwest Washington and, and, and particularly over parts of Virginia. Uh, and and with, with what I must say, uh, is admirable uh, speed the airlines have added these um, over the last uh, several years, these uh, planes which are far less noisy, far larger. And of course, this is an airport uh, in this district at least where we have tried to keep uh, in the perimeter flights so that we don't have these huge, um, uh, this huge number of flights uh, from the West Coast rather than for Dulles, notwithstanding the, the Senate, which on, I must tell you, an individual member basis, because that's how it's done, decides that the member wishes to get here from uh, the far West Coast to Washington and would rather not do what members do, and that is uh, to travel from Dulles. Um, I was very pleased to see that 
in spite of the fact that we have seen real progress here, that there is uh, further work being done, according to what I read here, Mr. Chairman, uh, through these environmental pilot uh, programs uh, for lower, lower emissions noise engine airframe technology, the, the notion of a pilot program to encourage that, I think will speed, help the economy and will speed airlines in what they uh, were, were already doing. So I, I hope that the, the FAA will take note of Mr. Uh, Capiano's uh, amendment and on their own will move forward with a 1-800 number, uh, I think that's the number he requested, uh, in order to make sure that this uh, constant um, frustration of, uh, of constituents is addressed, since it obviously could be done administratively. Well, I thank the gentleman for, uh, gentlewoman for those observations. I would, just, I, I would share her hope that the airlines would do things voluntarily, but experience shows us otherwise. And through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, under stage one aircraft operations, over 12,000 tons of pollutants were dropped on the District of Columbia and the Northern Virginia suburbs because of those older engines. And, and you could see the black smoke trailing out of the engines as they took off from National, dumping all over the neighborhood. And then, then came our legislation that I authored in, uh, in 1990 to uh, move aviation to stage three. That's why there are quieter engines today. And then the cost of fuel helped drive the airlines to uh, uh, seek out more fuel efficient engines and more e efficient airframes. Uh, but it's the Congress that has pressed this issue ahead at each stage. Uh, the gentleman is recognized to withdraw his amendment. Uh, so withdrawn, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, without objection, the amendment is withdrawn. Uh, the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Altmaier, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment may be considered as read. Without objection, so ordered. Critically ill or injured patients requiring <coughs> helicopter medical services are among the most vulnerable patients treated in our medical system. For these patients, emergency medical helicopters are not simply transport vehicles. They are mobile critical care units that are capable of delivering life-saving treatment. There is currently a lack of clarity between federal and state oversight of helicopter medical service providers, and this has a real impact on patients' lives. Here is just one patient's story to illustrate what I'm talking about. After a car accident, a child under two years old was taken to a local hospital for initial stabilization. The child had severe head trauma and was in shock. The decision was made at the hospital to transfer the child to the area's specialized pediatric hospital for surgery. The pediatric hospital, located less than 15 minutes away by air, accepted the transfer and offered to send the pediatric flight team. But the community hospital refused because they had an exclusive agreement with another helicopter medical service. The competing program did not have a helicopter immediately available, and rather than transfer the patient to another helicopter service, the hospital decided to wait. The wait lasted more than an hour, and the child died. This is unfortunately not an isolated incident. There's been an alarming increase in the number of fatal medical transport incidents over the last several years, and in the last year alone, there's been nine fatal accidents and more than 35 fatalities. In addition to these crashes, news reports and personal accounts tell of heartbreaking stories like the one I illustrated about critically ill or injured patients who did not get the medical care they needed in time and, or received inadequate medical treatment while in flight. Part of the problem is that under current law, states are prohibited from establishing service areas, bases of operation, hospital definition criteria. States are also limited in their ability to regulate the quality of medical care available aboard air ambulances. I believe states should have the ability to ensure emergency helicopters are properly equipped to meet patients' needs. And this is why I'm offering this amendment along with Congresswoman Candace Miller. It's identical to the bipartisan legislation that we previously introduced, H.R. 978, which is co-sponsored by many members of this committee. 
Our amendment would clarify the ability of states to govern helicopter medical services within their boundaries, just as they currently do for ground ambulances, in a way that protects patient safety while continuing to recognize the federal government's jurisdiction over aviation. Clarifying a state's ability to oversee the medical capabilities of emergency medical helicopters is critical to ensuring patients are transported appropriately and receive the highest quality care. Our amendment is supported by over 50 organizations, including air medical providers, air medical operators, the American College of Emergency Physicians, the National Association <laughs> of State EMS Officials, and the National Rural Health Association. I believe there's strong justification for including this amendment in FAA reauthorization, and I ask for the support of my colleagues, and I have spoken with the subcommittee chairman, Mr. Costello, and I have agreed to withdraw the amendment after discussion today, but I do plan to aggressively pursue this to see that it's incorporated as we move forward. Well, I appreciate the gentleman's offer to withdraw and intent to withdraw. Uh, this is an important issue, but it's one of several with the uh, medical helicopter uh, sector. We, we uh, have to consider flight dispatch operations, which are not available or present or part of those uh, operations. We uh, need to consider uh, flight to data recorder and voice recorders on those aircraft, and I think we have to do that in a separate setting. Uh, Mr. Costello. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I want to thank uh, my colleague from Pennsylvania, and as he indicated, uh, we have talked about this issue in the last few days. Uh, I, I have some concerns as well uh, as far as the FAA's ability to uh, regulate certain safety issues. Uh, I also want to make certain that uh, there are federal regulations with uniform standards uh, for those that cross state lines. Uh, for instance, in, in my congressional district in my part of Illinois, uh, a number of people are transported by using uh, medical evac helicopters from Missouri coming into Illinois to pick patients up and take them back to, uh, to St. Louis City or St. Louis County. So those are issues that we want to take a look at. I want to work with the gentleman. I'm committed to doing that. And let me also add that uh, we are, uh, uh, Mr. Petri and I uh, at the subcommittee level will be holding a hearing on this very issue uh, uh, later on. But uh, I thank the gentleman. It's an issue that uh, we need to address, and I look forward to working with him on it. And the gentleman from Wisconsin is yeah, ranking. I'd, I'd also thank the uh, uh, gentleman for offering them and then withdrawing it at this time. It is an important issue and we look forward to working with you and Ms. Miller and others who are concerned to sort out and come up with a, uh, um, a, a solution that addresses the problems that you raise and still avoids creating uh, problems in other areas which could occur if we have a patchwork of 50 different state regulatory uh, uh, regimes. Thank you. Others wish to be heard on the uh, Altmaier Amendment. If not, the, uh, without objection, the gentleman's amendment is withdrawn. And we'll continue to, to consider the uh, issues raised in, in the broader context. Uh, the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Hall, had indicated his intention to offer, but also to withdraw an amendment for the purpose of having a discussion. Uh, of his uh, proposal that would require all aircraft to be equipped with life preservers for every passenger. Uh, the subcommittee held, uh, the aviation subcommittee held a hearing on the U.S. Airways Flight uh, 1549 uh, accident and, uh, and, and, uh, and, ex and raised the issue and had discussion on life-saving equipment and the role that it played in saving lives on that uh, aircraft. Uh, I will include for the record the full uh, statement of uh, Mr. Hall on this issue, and of course the subcommittee will continue to review the matter. Does the gentleman from Illinois wish to be recognized? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, we, um, of course, have been working with Mr. Hall as a result of the, uh, the hearing that we had uh, uh, concerning the U.S. Airways um, uh, flight that uh, is being called the Miracle on the Hudson. Uh, he brings up some uh, interesting issues, and uh, we are committed to working with Mr. Hall and others who are uh, interested in pursuing this. I yield back. So without objection, the statement uh, by Mr. Hall, his amendment, uh, and, and my uh, remarks in support of, of uh, his, uh, or commenting on his concerns, will be included in the record. 
Are there other amendments? Hearing none, the chair recognizes uh, Chairman Costello for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that uh, the bill H.R. 915 as amended be approved and reported favorably to the House. Questions on the motion? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. The bill as amended is approved and ordered reported favorably to the House. Our last order of business is consideration of the fiscal year 2010 budget views and estimates. The uh, information is in every member's packet. Uh, the uh, views and estimates have been developed in bipartisan fashion. Uh, they, re they reflect a document uh, that uh, includes a statement that not every am mem member of the committee necessarily agrees with every aspect of the report. So we explicitly res reserve flexibility to discern, to discern and, and determine program needs as we work through the legislative process. Uh, I will withhold any further comments. I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Well, uh, uh, our side is uh, very supportive of the um, 2010 views and estimates document. Uh, I think that we have some very serious concerns about the president's uh, budget. Um, it represents some uh, serious disappointments for transportation, including uh, putting in there only 2 percent uh, of the $3.55 trillion budget for transportation. That amount uh, represents about a 1 percent increase in the highway funding level. Also very serious concerns that uh, the uh, T&I committee could lose some of its jurisdiction over the highway bill. Uh, there's an elimination of highway and transit uh, firewalls that gives me great uh, concern um, and a number of other things in the president's budget that we're going to have to work on. But uh, the way uh, this uh, views and estimates has been uh, uh, prepared and presented uh, is in concurrence with the minority and we, we support it. I appreciate the gentleman raising that scorekeeping score issue, and I wanted to hold that uh, till, the, uh, till the gentleman had expressed his views on it. Uh, we're in, in concert. We, uh, uh, the gentleman up there on his portrait look, looking out at us, Mr. Schuster, led us through that uh, fight in uh, 1998 uh, to achieve the long-held goal of, uh, of making the trust fund truly trustworthy. Uh, now comes uh, another Office of Management and Budget to change the budget treatment of our highway transit and highway safety and airport grant programs, all of which are funded through contract authority out of the respective highway and aviation trust funds. Uh, this new OMB is just like the old one. They don't want to score contract authority as budget authority, but rather to score it as obligation limitations imposed on the program subject to annual appropriations. That's wrong. We're not going to let them do that. That's not going to happen. If there is an effort to take this up to the appropriation process, we'll fight it on the floor. We'll, I hope, have 75 votes to do that. The gentleman from uh, Wisconsin. Mr. Chair, I'm Sorry. very happy to hear that. I just want to make, this is, we're at a crucial stage uh, going forward now. I just want to emphasize how important this budget is for the future of our highway transit and safety programs. It's probably safe to say that almost all of us on the committee want to see a growing, robust program to meet our overwhelming needs. The numbers that are in this year's budget resolution will be crucial as we move forward for several reasons. This budget will contain a specific amount of contract authority assuming we succeed in keeping contract authority as part of this program, which isn't even a safe assumption at this point, to be assigned to this committee for 2010 and beyond. If we take a bill to the floor that exceeds that amount, our bill is subject to a point of order for exceeding that allocation, unless it's protected in the rule. In order to do the kind of long-term bill that all of us want to do, we need to enact a budget that has an increase in funding for Function 400, transportation, and an increase in assumed revenues, and an increase in assumed revenues so that we can pay for the increased funding. 
These must be reflected in the budget. More than 10 years ago, as the chairman pointed out, when we were working on T21, we faced a similar situation. The budget resolution did not include adequate levels of contract authority in order to do the six-year reauthorization but that this committee contemplated. When we saw the budget and the numbers assigned to function 400 for transportation, it was clear that our leadership had no intention of allowing us to move a bill that would adequately fund highway and transit. Committee leadership, which then included Mr. Schuster, Jim Oberstar, and Nick Ray Hall, and me on the Highway Subcommittee, prepared a budget amendment that would have increased spending by $13 billion over five years, and we lost by only two votes in a late night vote that included a lot of arm twisting on the floor by uh, my former colleague, Mr. DeLay, and others in the Republican leadership. This was the only vote that we lost in the entire T21 battle, and ironically, it was our biggest victory because people saw the power of our effort, and ultimately, we were successful. Just as important, we have to stop the administration's proposed scorekeeping change that would wipe out the budget guarantees in T21 and contract authority. As it's been written, this would be the end of the highway bill as we know it. The same applies to the aviation bill. The aviation side, perhaps our biggest challenge uh, in the, is the 20, year, two, $20 billion effort to modernize the air traffic control system known as Next Gen. Will there be room in the budget to accommodate the spending that will be required for this critically needed program if there is as little as 1% growth in the program in the years ahead, which is what we face at this point? So our first fight on the highway and aviation reauthorizations has begun, and it has to be a bipartisan, and it certainly will be as far as this member is concerned. I thank the gentleman for that very strong, uh, straightforward, and uh, uh, insight into the, an historical perspective. Uh, you're so right about the long-term bill. If, we, if this uh, OMB proposition uh, survives, then six years won't mean anything. We'll have annual uh, highway and aviation authorizations, and that's all there will be is authorizations. There'll be no certainty for contractors, for states, for airport authorities uh, to uh, proceed with long projects that take more than a year to do. That was the purpose of, and it wasn't just the Republican leadership in the House, it was the Clinton administration uh, OMB and, and, the, uh, and the White House lobbying staff that worked that bill that, that night. I remember very well uh, Mr. Uh, Schuster and I stand, <laughs> standing in the back of the chamber and one after another member after being arm twisted by uh, Newt Gingrich and the chair of the Appropriations Committee and, and others uh, said, well, I'm sorry, I can't be with you. And then Bud asked me to make the closing speech around 2.30 in the morning and I heard all these great comments. It was a wonderful speech. I can't be with you. <laughs> and we lost by two votes. But you're so right, Mr. Petri. We won in the end because that joined the issue for so many people to, to come face to face with the reality. Oh, my God, we could lose everything here. And, uh, and, and the uh, purpose of the, of the trust fund would just vanish overnight. Well, we prevailed in the, in the subsequent, that was the budget fight. We, we prevailed on the, on the substantive bill itself. Uh, Mr. DeFazio remembers those battles very well himself, and I recognize the gentleman now. Um, I thank the chairman, and yes, I did not think we were going to have to revisit uh, those battles uh, with the Obama administration. I remembered an awful lot of talk about uh, rebuilding America's infrastructure during the campaign, and I want to help the president deliver on that promise. Uh, and this budget will not only not deliver on that promise, uh, this budget would actually uh, set us back dramatically. It totally contradicts the idea of rebuilding our economy and putting America back to work. Uh, if we go to, uh, uh, I mean, first off, that if, if we don't adopt a new authorization for a 21st century uh, program along the lines of what the chairman and I and uh, the minority have been talking about with a big vision for the country, the uh, obligation limits would drop by one half, one half, 50 percent on October 1st. Now, that means we're going to lose more jobs than might have been created 
through the stimulus on one day. We can see it coming. So that's, that's the, the first point. And then to go to an annual appropriation, what state is going to be able to obligate itself to an ambitious three- or five-year project to make substantial rehabilitation of our nation's crumbling infrastructure or to build a new transit system if all of the only commitment they can get from the federal government is, well, we'll give you the money this year, we're not sure about next year. Uh, the drop-off in construction activity uh, would compound from the, the reduction in the obligation limit for out years. Uh, this would be absolutely devastating. And I've got to hope that this was, as our former colleague Al Swift used to say, he used to talk about the trolls under the bridge at OMB, and every once in a while the trolls would come out and try and grab you and drag you under the bridge. And I've got to hope this is just some of the uh, trolls uh, who haven't uh, been routed out over the past few years, uh, and it does not reflect any higher level thinking uh, on the part of the Obama administration, and they will immediately take steps to correct uh, those at OMB and others who would do this. Uh, but if it does reflect uh, higher level thinking, then we're going to have to uh, change their minds and help them deliver on the promises they made, because this budget would not do that. It would be incredibly destructive of our infrastructure and our economic recovery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have news for the trolls and the green eye shade people at OMB. I wasn't with them in the previous administration, and I'm not with them in this administration, and I got news for them. The, the next transportation bill and the aviation bill aren't going to be written in the, in the press office of the White House. They're going to be written up here on Capitol Hill. And it's going to be a bipartisan effort, and we will stand together. And any members of this committee who can't stand with us on that can go see OMB about their high-priority projects. Anyone else? Maybe we have Mr. Uh, Schauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted uh, the, the chairman and members to know that this new member from Michigan is reading carefully the uh, documents provided to him. They're and dangerous. As, uh, uh, and I will be with you. Uh, but I was stunned when I looked at the last page uh, as well, looking at uh, FY09 versus uh, FY10, the highway funding estimates. Uh, I wanted to, for the record, register my concerns here, someone that comes from uh, a donor state, uh, state of Michigan, the freeze and thaw state, and the state with the highest unemployment rate in the country. And so I look forward to working with you to make sure that we adequately fund um, all of our transportation needs, but in this case particularly uh, our highway formula in a way that perhaps not only fully funds uh, the needs across the country, but uh, addresses some of the, uh, the, the problems of the current formula. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Micah? Um, just when you're ready to take the uh, so If there are no further comments, uh, and I move that the committee adopt the FY 2010 budget views and estimates. Questions on the motion? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. 2010 budget views and estimates are adopted pursuant to clause 4F of the rule of rule 10 of the rules of the house the views and estimates will be transmitted to the committee on the budget I ask unanimous consent the staff be authorized to make all necessary technical clarifying conforming changes to each of the bills ordered reported and the views and estimates adopted today to reflect the actions of the committee without objection so ordered I ask unanimous consent the chair after consultation with the ranking member have authority to strike or revise any provision of any bill or a resolution order reported today that would cause a sequential referral to another committee or cause the bill to be subject to a Budget Act or Rule 21 pay-as-you-go order, a uh, point of order, without objection so ordered. Pursuant to Clause 1, Rule 22, I ask unanimous consent. The committee authorize the chair or designee to offer such motions as may be necessary in the House to go to conference with the Senate on the bills ordered reported by the committee or similar Senate bills, H.R. 1262 as amended, H.R. 915 as amended. Pursuant to Rule 5A and B of the Rules of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, Chair notes the presence of a quorum for each of the actions taken on H.R. 1262 as amended, H.R. 915 as amended, and the budget views and estimates of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. The, the gentleman is recognized. Before you adjourn, uh, I want to submit my statement on the views and estimates, and I also want to apologize to you and my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle for after hearing your uh, criticism 
uh, on the views and estimate of my mild, meek, mannered, bipartisan approach to criticizing the Obama administration. It will never happen again, I can assure you. <laughs> we thank you for your mildness. With that, the committee is adjourned. God, if I'd known you all were going to read them, I would have joined you.